Hey, before we get into the show, I want to make a very special announcement about a live in-person event that I'm hosting June 25th through 27th in Sevierville, Tennessee, in East Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains. It's only limited to five people, so I only have a couple of spots left, but I wanted you as my listeners to get access to this. I want to give you the option to attend a mastermind intensive. This is going to be a three-day opportunity for you to unlock your potential with this mastermind intensive. So what is this about? It's a three-day mastermind intensive that's focused on the power of a true mastermind experience. Sunday night, we're going to get there around three o'clock and we're going to be focused on setting the foundation for the deep work that we're going to do over the next two days. You're going to get to meet each participant. We're going to have some downtime. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have a private chef on site cook an amazing food. We're going to have top shelf cigars and some bourbon and some rum if you're into that sort of thing. And then on Monday, we're going to spend the entire day focused on each unique challenge of each participant. The issues, the opportunities, whatever they're dealing with in their business, whatever you're dealing with, we're going to give you an opportunity to have an extended 90-minute hot seat session. On Tuesday, then we're going to take those 90-day or those 90-minute hot sessions and we're going to heart seat sessions, we're going to turn those into a 90-day action plan. So all day Tuesday, we're going to be working with each participant as a group to write out a 90-day action plan to get your business to the next level. What this opportunity is going to give you is to give you real intimate and supportive environment to tackle unique challenges that are holding you back from achieving your purpose in life, from achieving success. You're going to get actionable advice, feedback, support. It's a real mastermind. It's not just this conference you go to with a talking head. It's a group of guys that are going to be working together to help you achieve everything you want to achieve. This is going to be taking place in the breathtaking Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee in my cabin, my personal cabin called Million Dollar View, right on the edge of a mountain where we can see Mount LeConte from the back porch. It's absolutely beautiful. You're not going to want to miss this. So if you are interested, all you got to do is go to therealjasonduncan.com slash intensive therealjasonduncan.com slash intensive, or on the homepage, there's a banner at the top that has the announcement. You just click on it and go straight to it. Limited to five people. We only have a couple of slots left, so go check it out. I hope that you can make it. Now, let's get into the show. Hi, I'm Ron Story Jr., and you're listening to The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. And today, I enjoyed our our interview. I was able to talk about how I went from a um, poor kid in East St. Louis, Illinois, struggling, selling cans door to door, collecting my neighbor's cans to living all around the world in five different countries and building a successful software startup, even though I don't know how to code one piece of software. So if you're interested in doing that or just finding your own true path to success, check out this episode. Thanks again. Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs unlocked success and how their stories can help you do the same. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason has built multi-million dollar businesses that have been featured in Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. His life's mission now is helping entrepreneurs live what he calls hashtag the exit lifestyle. Introducing TEDx speaker, mastermind leader, author, entrepreneur, cigar aficionado, motorcycle enthusiast, and host of The Root of All Success, The Real Jason Duncan. The The Real Real Jason Jason Duncan. Duncan. Hey, welcome back to another episode. I am The Real Jason Duncan. You can call me JD. I've got Ron Story Jr. on the show today, and this guy has been a full-time entrepreneur for over 20 years, got his start in the financial business and then decided to get into the software biz. And now he's got a company called PitchDB that we're going to talk about at length on the show today and what it can do for you to get you in front of more people. But but, but that's not really the point of the show. The point of the show is how he built it, why he built it, where you know he lives in, in South America and how he as an American lives there successfully and why he chose to move to one of the scariest, most dangerous places on earth to begin his living abroad. He faced his fears and then we'll see what happens from that. So he's written a book called the first hundred miles. We'll talk a little bit about that in the show. He was born and raised in East St. Louis lives right now, full time in Medellin, Colombia. 
with his partner and, and and some kids. I can't remember off the top of my head. We talk about the kids on the show, but he has his kids there. And and what he's doing now with Pitch DB is absolutely fascinating. And I've really enjoyed this conversation that I had with Ron. So now let me tune you into the show. Please help me welcome Ron Story Jr. to the root of all success. Hey, Ron, welcome to the root of all success, my man. Jason, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it. Well, I'm always excited to talk to other people in the podcast industry and uh, that you are indeed that guy. So we're going to be talking a lot about podcasting today. We'll get into that in just a minute. But but uh, but you're you're in St. Louis today recording this from uh, I think you said pre-show you visiting your mom, but you live in Medellin, Colombia. So well, how did you get to Colombia from East St. Louis, Illinois? What happened? Man, you know, they have these things called flights. I just hopped on a plane and never came back. <laughs> no, let me stop being a knucklehead. No, um, a few years ago, I decided, yo, I want to see if there's um, other places in the world that I would love to live. I had spent most of my life in central Illinois and central United States. And um, one of my buddies was teaching down in Honduras. And I went down to visit and I'm like, yo, I should just keep traveling. So five countries living later. I ended up in um, Medellin, Colombia is my sixth location, the sixth country I've lived in. And I've been there for the last four years permanently. Wow. So how's life down there compared to, um, you know, living in, in the United States? Obviously there's different cultures and that type of thing, but like, how, how are you able to do business? I mean, tell, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same. In some ways it's a lot easier, right? So, um, you know, Medellin is a very modern city, 7 million people. Um, I mean, it's very modern infrastructure. I mean, it's it's a great city to live in. It's like living in Chicago, right? Um, but the only difference is that, you know, everybody speaks Spanish. So you have to, in order to live there effectively, you probably need to know some Spanish or you'll just end up overpaying for everything or people will just be taking advantage of you. Even though that's not the nature of everybody, you'll run into those people that notice that you don't have um, a strong Spanish background and they will um, try to extract their, their pound of flesh from you. But it's so a great place. Long, I would, if it was bad, I would, I would come home. How long did it take you to, to pick up Spanish? Oh, I still don't have it. I mean, I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> my Spanish is terrible. Right. But um, the great thing is that my, my, my partner, she only speaks Spanish um, our kids are in bilingual schools and, you know, I only talk to them in English. They talk to, to me in English. They talk to their mom in Spanish, you know, so, you know, we, we've, we figured out a system, but my Spanish is horrible. I mean, it's getting better, but, uh, yeah, it, it's not, I wouldn't be giving any speeches. I wouldn't do a podcast in Spanish. I promise you that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been to Honduras. I've never been to I've never been to Colombia. We used to do when when I was in the ministry, we had uh, our church sponsored um, a ministry in Honduras in Tegucigalpa, and we would go down there every summer. And I, I guess I went for three or four years in a row. And uh, of course, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, as you probably know better than me, was at the time not one of the greatest cities in the world, but today, like one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And so, I don't think I, I haven't been involved in that in in Cali. How, how long has that been? 15 years more, more or more, but uh, I haven't been there in a long time, but, but I really liked the people when I was there, the, the, the people were so genuine. The culture was, was really family oriented. So I can only really imagine you, you've, you've enjoyed that part of it significantly. Yeah. When I was in Honduras, I was in uh, SPS San Pedro Sula, which at yeah. the time was ranked the most dangerous um, city in the world. That wasn't a war zone. Right. And I'll tell you the logic. It's interesting why, how I ended up choosing that place. Well, I was afraid of traveling and I had seen this movie called Hostel where they were like, if you stay in this hostel, somebody's going to kidnap you and cut your Achilles tendon and all of this. And I'm like, wait, if I could go to the most dangerous place on earth, the rest of my traveling will be easy. So if I could just go there and just get rid of all the fear, you know, I only lasted like two weeks before I, I left. I was like, dude, this is too much. But, but <laughs> That was my introduction to traveling and it just alleviated all the fears because I knew that was probably the worst it could get right in my mind. At least it may not have been true, but that that was the mentality that I had. And I think that that kind of plays into what your podcast is about, which is, you know, how do you define success? I think success is defined through trial and error. 
right? I, I think you you try things, you you test out a hypothesis, and then you learn from it, and then you keep going, right? So that was my um, hypothesis with me wanting to be a successful uh, world traveler was that I needed to test to see if I could survive in a bad environment. If I could, then I know it would be okay in an average or great environment. So, so what year did you go to San, San uh, Pedro Sula? When, when did you do that? 2014. Okay. So we're a little less than 10 years ago now. So nine years ago. And you said you were there, you did that on purpose to see, Hey, if I can survive here, I'm going to be fine in the rest of my travels. I, I yep. think, um, I think there's an interesting correlation that I, that I might want to explore with you on the show is that as entrepreneurs, we deal with some of the same stuff to face our fears. Sometimes we have to face what's negative. You know, all of us have experienced as entrepreneurs, if you're worth anything, you've experienced near bankruptcy, if not bankruptcy, you've experienced no, no money, you know, threats of lawsuits. I mean, these things happen yet those who survive and push beyond that are going to thrive. And so you, are a walking example of the concept of facing your fears early and on purpose so that you could thrive. I think, how do you see that, Ron? I mean, do you see what I'm trying to get at there from business yeah, versus life? 100%. I mean, I didn't grow up in the, in the nicest place on earth. I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois, which, you know, even today, St. Louis is the murder capital of the United States, right? So, you know, I grew up in a tough place already. So I, I wasn't foreign to the idea of going to another tough place because that's what I was used to. But I, I understood that that was what made me an entrepreneur. So when everyone else was talking about losing everything, I didn't have anything to lose to begin with. When I first started my first business, I was already broke. So like, oh, I'm going to go broke. I'm already broke. What do you mean? Like, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, so the bottom is where I came from. So understanding that. And I think that that's what a lot of people are afraid of. They're afraid of going to the bottom. But Tim Ferriss had a great quote in his book, Four Hour Work Week. And he said, create the environment that you're afraid of, live in it so that you'll know how you'll react in it when you're put in that situation. Most of the time, it's not that bad, right? Our circumstances really aren't that bad. It's just our egos and what we expect of ourselves. That's what usually is racking our brain and punishing us and putting that stress on us. But once I realized, look, I've been broke before. I grew up broke. So me going back to being broke wasn't going to hurt because I'm smarter than what I was at the beginning and I can get out of it, which I had done already. Well, I wasn't going to mention anything about East St. Louis, but since you brought it up, <laughs> you know, I was thinking that well, as you, as we were talking about that, it's like East St. Louis, St. Pedro Sula, like, is there a difference? <laughs> it's the language is maybe the difference, yeah. but yeah, it's, the it's the, for, for people that don't know, like for people that don't know, I, I'm from Nashville. So, so we're only about six hours from East St. Louis, St. Louis area. And I've been to St. Louis before, and I've also been to East St. Louis. And, and, and I, I don't know from firsthand experience how dangerous it is, but I have heard the stories and I don't go, I know about it. And it's really, it's, it's a shame. It's a, I mean, you're from there, obviously you, you've got a deeper connection than I do, but to, but to know that you, I grew up poor. What, what, what's going broke later going to do to me? Like I already experienced it. I love, I love that perspective. So when you, when you moved there, you only, you only stayed there a couple of weeks and you started traveling around. When did you, when did you start the podcast? Cause podcasting was kind of a big thing that you're, you're involved in. You've written a book. I want to talk about your book, but when did you start your businesses? Was it, that I, it had to have been before that. So did you just take the yep. business on the road or did you go there to start something different? No, no, no. So I'll give you my background. So I started off as a financial advisor while I was in college. So I was selling insurance and investments um, since May of 2000. So I used to do that for a company called Northwestern Mutual. And I did that for four years. Um, in 2004, I ended up with eight Allstate agencies out in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and then in 2007, I had turned that into managing 300 offices for farmers insurance. Um, to kind of, that's, that kind of gives you the background of where I was able to accumulate some money to be able to kind of have right. some, uh, I guess today they would call it fire, like financially independent, retired early. Like I had accumulated enough money before that to be able to have some independence, to be able to make some decisions. So in um, 2012, I started to get involved in the software world as a sales consultant for um, local venture capital firms here in St. Louis, I was consulting with their portfolio companies, helping them to build um, uh, sales systems inside of those companies. So I, I came to the conclusion that, Hey, 
if I keep doing this and they're just giving me a consulting fee and they're going on to exit at these high multiples and they're selling the companies, I don't have any equity. I'm an idiot. So I found a company that was failing in 2018. I bought that company, which is now PitchDB, and that's what I run. So am I understanding you, you bought the company that was not doing well and you turned you turned it around, PitchDB? Yep, I, yep, exactly. I, I bought a company out of Austin, Texas that was a, a data accumulation company. And my thoughts were, look, look, this is like people are selling unlimited data for $99. You can get unlimited people's email addresses for 99 bucks, right? I don't want to do that. I want to be able to add, I can educate the data up and make it more valuable. I can sell them for a dollar a piece. So I turned that data company into a, a niche data company that only provided podcast contact information. Huh. That's really, really interesting. So, so your pitch DB company is, is, is just people like me who run podcasts is contact information to get to people like me. Is yeah. Right? It's podcast speaking gigs and press opportunities. Cause they all go together, right? It's just a different platform. If you're on a podcast, you're on an audio platform. If you're doing a speaking gig, you're doing a live platform. And if you're impressed, you're in a written platform, but it's all exposure. It's just different platforms for you to get that exposure. So, let me ask you about how that works. So if, if I if I want to get access to or use your software and your platform yeah. to get access to so and so, and I say, hey, I've been trying to get in touch with so and so, you say, hey, I've got their phone number, I got their email address, I, I can get you whatever you need. It costs X number of dollars to get to it. It's, I'm sure it works a little bit differently than I explained, but is that the idea? No, it works exactly as you explained. People pay for credits, so you can buy credits a la carte, or you can pay monthly, but a credit costs about a dollar. So if you wanted to reach out to 50 podcasts that you had put on a list, it would cost you 50 bucks, basically, to reach out to those 50 podcasts. You would probably get booked on 10 of them, right? So our, our universal um, average for podcast bookings is one out of every five pitches that are sent results in a conversation with the host for a booking. Um, so, yeah, that's what we do. So how do you – you don't have to give away your secret sauce, but how are you getting – how do you get this? I mean, you just have a team of researchers that just go look people up and then you start just collecting the data and putting a database. That's yep. it. So, so the podcasts are a little bit easier because Apple and Spotify and all of these companies, they have APIs that you can connect to in order to gather that data. Um, they don't like you doing that, but if you can circum circumvent their systems, you can get access to that data live. Um, but as far as speaking gigs, media outlets, writers, contributors to Forbes and Fortune and all of that, that stuff is manually gotten by my team. So we manually go out and find speaking gigs. We manually scrape, you know, websites for Forbes and all these other places looking for their employees, whether it's on LinkedIn or whatever. So that's a lot of it is done manually. So we're building that. We're building the first database of its kind. Wow. I, listen, that's impressive, man. That. That's really, really interesting. So, so let me, let me ask you, I'll kind of turn this into, into more of a personal question because I, I am obviously yeah. a podcaster, speaker, author. So if I said to my podcast manager, Jade, I said, Hey Jade, I want you to get me on these 10 podcasts or find 10 podcasts that you think I would fit. So she w could use your service to say, go in and buy credits or something and then find yeah. those contacts and then just email them cold and say, Hey, you know, the real Jason Duncan wants to be on your show. Are you interested in having him on your show? Is that, is that pretty much how it works? Yeah. So we don't even give you the email address. Like we don't just say, hey, take the email address and figure it out. You just connect your account and you send the email directly from your Gmail or Microsoft account from inside of our software directly to you. Right. So, you know, that's how it works. We have the e emails inside. You just connect your email account, drop in a template. Our templates were written by a, um, journalist that writes for a hundred different magazines. So we know that they work. And, you know, this person has been pitching people for years as a professional. So he wrote all of our templates and that's what we use. So you're, you're getting a professional pitch inside of a professional oh. system. Got, okay. Okay. Now it's becoming more clear. All right. I see it now. So, so we, so we sign up for the service and then I say, these are the ones I want to go on. I go in and say, click, you know, I just, I'm essentially just clicking and it sent, automatically sends these emails to these people trying to get me on their shows and, and they reach back out and we set something up. So there's some leeway for you to be able to go in and change and say what you want to say, but we give right. you the pitch and it's your approval. So we don't blindly send on your behalf, but
but we'll give right. you the pitch to what we think you should say because we don't want the liability of sending something. You're like, oh, I don't want you to say that. No, no, no. You approve it first. <laughs> you put it in there. You you have some. You have to put the eggs and the milk in the cake mix, but we'll give you the flour with the sugar and the yeast and everything, kind of like Duncan Hines. All right. I, 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 so I dig it. So now you started that in 2018. Is that right? Yep. I, I bought that company uh, January 7th of 2018, and it went live November the 11th of 2019. Let's take a quick break to thank our amazing sponsors for making this podcast possible. 40 years ago, you weren't in business unless you had your business in the yellow pages. You remember those things? <laughs> and 30 years ago, you weren't in business unless you had a door-to-door -door salesman. 20 years ago, you weren't in business unless you had a website. And today, you're not in business unless you're doing social media content. Am I right? Social media content. Social media content in the form of like micro content, which is 30 to 60 second spots on Instagram reels or TikTok or YouTube shorts. That's the way business is done. As a matter of fact, that may be how you found out about this podcast or me as a business coach. This medium that we're using today to communicate what we do is vitally important. And just recording yourself isn't enough. You've got to do it right. And my friends over at Story do it right. And one of the problems with doing it wrong is that you sit around thinking, well, what the heck am I going to record? How, what am I going to say? How am I going to say it? Like, I don't know what to talk about. Well, story takes all of that away from you. Stop wasting time trying to come up with content because story will send you a video prompt on what to record. You can pick the categories you want to record in, whether it's real estate, entrepreneurship, finance, relationship, leadership, life insurance. It could be anything. Don't waste time on that. And by the way, if you're not confident in talking on video or if the video editing portion takes up way too much of your time, Story will edit the videos to perform well on social media. They add the subtitles, the pop-ups, the zoom cuts. They remove all the filler words like uh and um and uh. They remove the awkward pauses. And then they take that video and post it for you. They write the captions, they add the relevant hashtags, and they post it on the platforms that you care about the most. It's exactly what you need to be in business today and to be successful at it. So if you want to learn how to do social media the way the influencers do, you need to go to therealjasonduncan.com slash story. And that's story with two Y's. Why? Because they're awesome. Go to therealjasonduncan.com slash story. That's S-T-O-R-Y-Y for 10% off your first three months to try story out. You're going to thank me later. I love talking about this sponsor because it's oftentimes a lot of people talk about sponsors on their shows. You have sponsors and they either don't use them or they might have used them once and they're not really in love with it. They just take their money. <laughs> and, and certainly there's nothing wrong with that. But this sponsor, this one of my sponsors of the podcast is Story, S T O R Y Y. Two Y's. Why? Because they're awesome. If you've ever wondered how these influencers do their Instagram reels and their TikToks and their YouTube shorts to look so amazing where they've got the zoom cuts and the pop-ups and the on-screen illustrations, whether it's cartoons or actual images or videos that get responses that people go, Ooh, I want to talk to that. If you want to know how people do that, that is exactly what story does. They take your videos and they make you look like an influencer. They make you become an influencer and they will post it for you. They'll write the captions. They'll add the relevant hashtags. They put it on the platforms that you care about the most. And after that content's posted, they take it even one step further to boost it to your past clients, your leads, or anyone that you want to target. And they even have someone log into your social media profile to engage with other people's posts to drive engagement on your profile. Story truly takes a headache away from doing social media content from start to finish. And they have a mission to help people nurture and cultivate their relationships by sharing your message digitally. And they even have an app that makes it easy to upload your content and track everywhere your video is at. And I've been using them for a long time. And I told them, I said, look, guys, I love what you're doing. I want to recommend you to everybody. You need to be a sponsor of my podcast. And so they're a co-sponsor of this podcast. And they're also the exclusive sponsor of my live webinar series, Entrepreneur Master Series, because they're that good. I tell everybody about them. So go to therealjasonduncan.com slash story to learn more. And that's therealjasonduncan.com slash story, S-T-O-R-Y-Y. Why are there two Ys? 
because they're awesome. You'll get 10% off your first three months if you go to that link, therealjasonduncan.com slash story. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now, back to the show. Wow, so it took you a while to get this thing turned turned around the right way, huh? Yeah, because we were doing it manually. We started to do it manually in order to... to to um, like fund the new development and all of that and to find out how the system should work. So we basically built the system that we were, that we would want to use ourselves, Right. So it's, if anybody ever logs in, they'll see it's like, dude, a salesperson built this because it has all these graphs that tracks how many pictures you've sent and how many people have opened them and what's your booking ratio, all of this stuff that salespeople care about like me, because that's what I wanted to see. Um, instead of, you know, things that a podcaster probably would care about. They probably wouldn't care about what their closing ratio was for pitching podcasts, but that's important to people like me. Yeah. Well, so that's cool, man. So you, so you went live November, 2019 and uh, yeah. you probably hit that about as good as a podcasting company could ever hit in the history of the world. Because you want to know what happened in March of 2020, man, the world went Whoop, we're all home doing this. We're all doing on, we're on zoom. We're on Riverside. Like I'm on recording this. We're doing podcasts. So did it, did it blow up pretty quickly? Tell me about how, how the success I actually it went the other way. It, it's interesting. Really? So we talk about persistence and why you have to keep going and learning and, and testing experiments. The original pitch DB did not include podcast. It was just for speaking gigs. Right. Um, so it was for people to get booked for live speaking gigs. So I had all these partnerships with these speaking organizations and, you know, they would sell it. We, we were selling it to their members about them getting speaking gigs. And then, as you said, March 2020 came along and we're like, well, ain't no more speaking gigs. We got to figure out something. So <laughs> I was like, a uh, podcast, that's the speaking gig from the house. Let's figure out how we can add these daggone podcasts in here. So. We started focusing primarily on podcasting at that point because there were no live speaking gigs, but podcasting was taking off, but it wasn't, we weren't ready for that. Right. And everybody was, oh man, I don't have any money to pay for this. And, you know, and I'm like, dude, come on, let's, let's, we just got to figure out a way to do it. So, but we survived. I mean, you know, we're over 2000 people that use it now. Um, so it's, I don't have any complaints. I mean, we're, we're growing every day and, it's a good thing. That's that's great, Rob. So so again, this goes back to facing your fears. While you didn't choose that that your platform was aiming at something that just went uh, as extinct, <laughs> it went extinct for a while. <laughs> you you said, okay, we're going to aim at live events in November. We're great. We've been working on this for two years. Let's go. And then COVID, you know, like the governments of the world, tell us that we're going to die if we breathe somebody else's air and we can't go out in public. And so speaking gigs are over and you're like, okay, I'm facing another fear, a fear of not having any income. This is not working, but you pivot, you learn, okay, if I, if I go to virtual, which is podcast. So if you had to put a percentage on podcast appearances versus speaking gigs or, or published media, what's the percentages of your, your clients that are using the, or, or getting access? To yeah. Those? Yeah. So, so uh, right now, 60% of our searches are all about podcasts now, right? Another I would say 25% are about speaking gigs and maybe five to 10%, whatever's left over is a mixture of press and stuff like that, where somebody's trying to get in, in the local newspaper or um, in a magazine or something like that. So what's well, cool. So uh, do you have a standard fee for access to this on a monthly basis or is it credit based? How does your financial model work? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's credit based. Anybody who's listening right now, you can go and sign up for free and get a free account so that you can look around and start building your list. And when you're ready to pitch, you can either buy uh, a la carte credits that never expire, or you can subscribe on a monthly basis and you get a discount if you subscribe on a monthly basis, of course. Um, but yeah, that's how it works. Nice. Nice. So, uh, this has been a successful venture for you. Is this, is this going the direction that you want it to go? Yeah. I mean, so here's my mentality with anything that I, I look at. So if I look at the capital that was invested in building this and, and purchasing the original database, how would that capital have performed if I had put it into the market or into an alternative investment? And right now this is outperforming anything that I would have done on the outside. Why? Because it pays a dividend plus it builds equity, right? So if I would have just put it into the stock market, depending on the stocks, the stocks that are taking off, they're not paying dividends. I get a monthly dividend off of this called 
a paycheck, right? But every user that we put on builds the equity at a multiple that is way higher than if I had a traditional business. So no, this is the, the smartest thing that I've done. So what do you think your key to success has been? Like if you had to go back and pull out like everything Ron Story Jr. has been able to accomplish in life, this one thing helped me unlock success more than anything else. What is it for you? Yeah, it, it's always being curious and not just being curious. I think a lot of people say, oh, man, I'm curious. Yeah, but you can have questions. But if you never try to seek the answers to those questions, you're an idiot. Right. So you're really not curious unless you seek the answers. Right. So I've always been a curious person that would go find the answers, not just, oh, I have a question. No, I'm going to go ask that question now. And the faster I can have a question, find the answer, have a question, find the answer. I've been able to iterate my life, not just iterate the software, but iterate my life to to be where I'm at today. So always be curious. I love it. So now be, it be curious, but find the answer. You got to find the answers, though. You can't just have this head full of questions like, man, I always wanted to ask somebody that. No, ask them. Ask somebody. Right? You just never know. You know, I mean, I've, I've been able to connect with some of the top people in the world just by asking, hey, do you know this guy? Yeah, I know him. I can. You can what? You can introduce me. Cool. Let's do it. Right. So it's just just be curious and, and seek the answer with that curiosity. All right. So how do you find how do you define success personally? So my personal definition of success is, am I pursuing something that I believe is worthwhile? And am I willing to pursue that for the rest of my life? Right. So I don't look at success as a destination. Like people say, success is the journey, not the destination. I agree with that. Right. But I think complete success is when you're on the journey that you chose. Right. So I don't just measure it. I will use a great example, such as Oprah Winfrey. Most people think Oprah Winfrey is really successful because she's had a great show, but maybe she, her real thing that she wanted to be was a mother. Well, she don't have any kids, so she sucks at that. Right. So success isn't just about how much money you make in business. It's about how your friends see you, how your family, I care about what my kids think more than anything. Right. So, you know, am I a good partner? Am I a good father to my kids? Am I a good, you know, so success is all encompassing, all encompassing for me, but for other people, I don't know how they define it, but how am I outside of business? Because the business can go away tomorrow. If I get in a car wreck, somebody's got to wipe my butt, right? And if they don't love me enough to do that, who cares how much money I made? Because they're just going to take the money and leave me with poopy pants, right? So <laughs> I think of success altogether, not just uh, how much money I make, because they can take that while I'm in the bed. So, so on that definition, so pursuing something worthwhile and you're, you're content to continue to do that the rest of your life. If that is your definition of success, do you, using that definition, do you consider yourself to be a successful person? In the words of Stone Cold Steve Austin, Austin hell yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I live where I want to live. I work in the business that I want to work in. I, I have the partner that I chose. I'm taking care of my kids. I mean, I'm a very successful person. Um, hopefully I'll, I'm somebody that other people want to be considering where I came from. Um, you know, I don't just look at where I'm going. I look at where I've come from and to come off of 2029 Trinley in East St. Louis and to be able to say that I live in, in six other countries and, you know, I run a great company. If, if you don't aspire to be that, that's okay. Pick someone bigger, but somebody this, I live their dream right now. Well, that's awesome. And so what, like, what's next? Are you just, are you settling at settling down, like putting roots down in Medellin or, 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 or what's, what's next? Yeah. So I've been in Medellin for four years. So, I mean, we, we may go somewhere else. It just depends on the, you know, if we want to um, hire a, a teacher to come along with us to, cause we have a first grader, right? So we have to make sure that he can be educated if we were to go and start traveling or find a, another city where we can get him installed in the school. So um, but right now I'm in Medellin. This is where I'll be um, for the foreseeable future. As far as business wise, I'll always be looking for great companies to buy. Um, you know, I, I did another great um, partial acquisition recently um, to add another company to the portfolio in the last two months. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is what I do. I want to buy companies that fit my vision and um, grow them. 
So you've got pitch DB, you've got a background in um, background in software. Uh, so, uh, that's software, but you got a background in insurance and financial investments. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you're looking for in terms of the type of company, or is it the cash flow and, and revenue, or what? What are you looking for? Yeah, so I, I love I love anything that's software based, and the reason being is that. The multiples are great. If you can find a, a growth mechanism, you can have great multiples on the exit, but you, it provides you with high margin cash flow in the in the um, meantime while you're building that. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of great founders out there that could code, but they couldn't sell. And I think that that's where the match is made in heaven. A lot of them are just tired of babysitting this this project that isn't working. And they have product market. They may not have product market fit or product founder fit. Sometimes you have to have the right person that started that company for it to take off, right? So I always give you a great example. I'm I'm not in the I'm not like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So if I were to start a gym tomorrow, it wouldn't be the right fit because I'm not a bodybuilder. But someone who like Alex Hormozzi, who has who's always flexing and has these big calves, he's the right person to do a gym. Right. So um, I, I think you have to have product founder fit and that that makes all the difference. So um, there's a lot of people who have developed software that aren't the right fit to take that company. And I may be. I like it. I like the idea. Now, <clears throat> just a couple of technical questions I want to ask you about moving yeah. to Columbia. So mm -hmm. as a U.S. citizen, um, I, I assume passport U.S. Did, have you have you got citizenship in other countries? You got passports in other countries. How, how does that work? Because and the reason, let me tell you why I'm asking, Ron, is a lot of people who listen to the show are entrepreneurs who also like the idea of what you're accomplishing. They want to go live in Costa Rica. They want to live in South America somewhere. They might want to live in Europe for a while, but they don't know the technicality. Like, how does that work? You just take a passport, you get a visa. How, how does that work? Tell, give me, give me a couple minutes on that. Yeah. So there's almost a hundred countries that. As a U.S. citizen, you can go to just on your passport for 180 days, right, out of the calendar year, right? So if you if someone were to leave now in June, they could stay until January of this year, and then January is going to start over, so they can stay another six months, right? So you get six months per calendar year in about 100 countries. It may be less than that, but somewhere around 100 countries, you can go without needing to apply for a visa, right? While you're there, they'll have different types of visas. In, mm -hmm. in Medellin, they have a thing called the digital nomad visa, where not only will they give you the six months, which is normal with your passport, but you can get another two years just to come there and to live and to work because that's what they're trying to push in Colombia now. So different countries have different um, types of visas that allow people to come in, but about 100 countries that you would want to go to have, you can just come in with, the U S passport and be fine. So living in another country as an entrepreneur is really not as hard as people like me might think that it is. Huh? That's what you're telling me. No, I mean, you got to think we, we live in a modern society, right? Like imagine your parents saying, man, it was really hard living in 2010. <laughs> Most countries outside of the U S they're probably at about 2010 as far as their level of modern modernity. I guess that's the word there. They're, I guess, how do you say it? Mo modernity. modernity, yeah, modernity. That, that's a hard word, man. <laughs> right? They're about as modern as 2010, right? So, was it really difficult back in 2010? No, because we get 2010 with the iPhone. They didn't have the iPhone in 2000, like the iPhone 15 in 2010 or whatever, right? So, um, you have Uber, you have Uber Eats, you have everything that you would imagine in the U.S. I mean, KFC, all the same restaurants, even better restaurants than what I could get here. You know, in Medellin, they have a 4D movie theater, right? Where the seats move, it blows air, it shakes, it does all of that. And it's $3, right? IMAX is $3 for a movie ticket in Medellin. $3. Filet mignon, dry age filet mignon is $7 a pound, right? For dry age filet mignon, $7 a pound. Right, dry age ribeyes like five bucks a pound. Where are you getting that? That's forty dollars a pound in St. Louis, probably sixty to seventy bucks a pound in New York. So imagine being able to start a company, hire great people because most of my employees are there, and cut your cost of living like you wouldn't imagine. I mean, it's the you know people have like what, what's the one thing called fire? Like I mentioned, financially independent, retire early. 
But then there's like fast fire. This is like extreme fire. This is like forest fire, right? You can go wow. even faster because on 200 grand saved, you can produce $4,000 a month, right? And be okay. Wow. Well, here's a question I've always thought about because I know I, I have virtual assistants in the Philippines and the cost of their, you know, their cost per hours between two and five or six bucks an hour as compared to having somebody do the same thing here is going to be 20 to 25, 30, sometimes dollars an hour to get the same things done, maybe more. Yep. Uh, so I've all, I know that in, in the Central America, South America, there's a lot of Argentinians. Uh, who do VA work. A lot of people in Brazil do VA work. A lot of Central Americans do VA work here for, for Americans. And, and the reason is the labor cost and the cost of living is so low and it makes sense to use that. So I get that. And I, and what you're explaining a hundred percent get, but here's my question. And I think a lot of people wonder this. All right. You still got to fly back home and you get on an airplane. that has got to come to the United States and go back. Is the flight originating from Colombia to the U S as cheap and, and, and differential as the filet mignon is, or is it still the traditional price that I would have to pay if I booked a ticket leaving St. Louis to go to Columbia? Yeah. So living in Medellin, I'm three hours from Miami, like three and a half hours from Miami. I can do round trip to Miami if I buy it two weeks ahead of time for 200 bucks. So it is cheaper. So when they originate the flight in another country that you're getting a huge yeah, discount. Yeah, because the there, there aren't all the TSA fees, right? Uh, so a lot of like 60% of your ticket cost in the U.S., is TSA and airport landing fees, right? So um, a lot of airlines now will outline that and say, look, we're only taking this part. This is what TSA is. This is what this is, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, but I mean, they have constant flights that are just going to Miami or Orlando all the time. So they, they're running the same routes four times a day on every airline. So, I mean, a $200 ticket on, you know, Avianca or Copa, isn't unusual to go to Miami and back round trip. Well, and then, uh, yeah, wow. That's, that's, I, I flew to Vegas. I, I'll, from I'll give you an example. I bought my ticket to come here the day before. Right. And a one way ticket from Medellin to St. Louis was about 350 bucks the night before less than 24 hours before the flight. That's crazy. I, I was, I was about to say, I, I flew to, I flew to Vegas from Nashville nonstop Southwest flight in May of 2022. So a little over a year ago, $1,100. Yeah. That's Can you lot. believe that? That's insane. <laughs> that's insane. For Southwest, that's a lot for Southwest, man. Yeah. That's and a it first was in the middle of the week. It was the middle of the week and it was crazy. And so, so like I, I, I couldn't believe I paid $1,100 for a, a Southwest. I think it's like a four hour flight from Nashville to Vegas and back. It was 1100 bucks. And it was, and here's, here's my thing. Of course, it was at the end, like the mask mandate lifted the day, the week before. And that's actually why I was, what I was waiting on. I was like, I'm not wearing a mask on an airplane. So I got to wait for this to be done so I can fly. <clears throat> well, today that flight, my dad was asking me the other day because he, he has a friend that he wants to go. Uh, they're going to go to, uh, to Vegas for, for something specific. And he said, how much, and he doesn't fly. He never flies. He's like, how much is a flight to Vegas? And my last time buying a flight to Vegas, my memory was it's 1100 bucks. And he goes, oh, my gosh. Well, I don't guess I'm going. Well, then I pull, pulled it up, and it's only only 500 bucks now. That's still expensive. But 500 bucks versus 1100 Anyway, I digress. I've just – I've yeah. always been – Ron, I've always been curious about people who like you. You know, if you live in Argentina, you live in Colombia, you live in these other countries where things are cheap, is the, are the flight cheap? You answered the question. So let yeah. me ask you this. Even within the, even within the country, it's, it's pretty cheap. So um, I live in the mountains in Medellin. We're like 7,000 feet above sea level. So oh, there's wow. no beach anywhere around us, but it's 75 degrees, 365 days a year, it, 75 degrees every single day. Right. So it's the best place to, if you want to play golf all the time. Right. But if we want to go to the beach, a round trip ticket to the beach the night before is about $90 round trip. If I wanted to fly to Cartagena and I planned it a month ahead of time, I can get a round trip ticket for $40. Right. And that's including a bag. So, you know, when I take me and the kids and, and my girl and we go we go for vacation, we just plan it a three weeks ahead of time. And we got three people, including the nanny on the flight for or four people for less than 200 bucks on a round trip flight. Man. Well, you keep coming back home to see your mama. I'm pretty sure she <laughs> loves that. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's why you're here. So thank you for being on the show. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a couple of questions before we finish up today. So I like to ask this question of all my guests. 
it, it, you know, looking at all of your experiences as an entrepreneur, world traveler, living in different countries, if you, you if you want to talk to the entrepreneur and listen to this show, he or she is looking at, hey, how do I become successful? What piece of advice would Ron Story Jr. give that person? What would you say? So the first thing is define what, what you mean by success, because Jason's definition of success is probably not the same as mine, right? And the only definition of success that matters is yours, right? Define what you want that dream life to look like and then work backwards on how to get there, right? So when I was like early, my early 20s, a guy told me, he says, Ron, think about what you want to have on your, on your headstone when you're dead and then draw your life backwards from there. Now, have there been some detours along the way? Sure. But the principles and what I want to be known for, and the things that I, the values that I have, those haven't changed, right? Just my vehicles of, of achieving those outcomes have changed. So define what you want your success to look like. That's the only thing you have to do. Once you've done that, it's easy to know where you're going. You're not wandering around, bouncing from one thing to another because you're principle based at that time. Tell us a little bit about your book, The First 100 Miles. Yeah, so The First 100 Miles is based on the, the concept that if you could learn to solve problems for people within your first circle, you can get referrals out to other people. And within your neighborhood or within your city, there's probably enough business to make you a multimillionaire, right? But a lot of times we think that we need to be famous and we need to be on Good morning, America, and all of these things, those are vanity metrics, right? So, you know, a lot of people don't know me um, overall as a business person, but within the podcasting and cold email space, I'm known. People know me for that because that's where I want to be known at, right? So you can find um, a lot of opportunity within probably 100 miles of where you are. And I, I say that I use 100 miles because every business isn't online, right? So if you if you strive to be the best floral business in your city and you just start killing, killing it with florals and uh, flowers and customer service, eventually you will be the go to florist and you will eat up everybody. You can go buy up your competition. Right. So you don't have to be a software company to, to believe that. So just be the best and you'll be surprised that you can dominate without having to leave 100 miles. And that's weird coming from a guy who's gone 4,000 miles away from his house to give that part of advice. But I, I, I've learned that that's true. Most of my business is built on referrals. Well, that's a good, I, so now I get it. And that, that's a very good perspective. So thank you for writing the book and thank you for the encouragement that you've given the listeners today. Um, I want to go back to pitch DB and give you the opportunity to talk to people because I know there's a lot of people that want to get on stage. They want to get in published media and they want to get on podcasts. And now that I've learned about pitch DB, like I want to sign up, I want to be a part of this because I think what you, I think what you're offering is really great. I want to be on podcasts and I'm on, I'm on probably an average of two shows a week as a guest. And then I record three or four shows a week by myself as, as the host. So I would love to do this. So you've got a, we've got an affiliate uh, a link that people can go and sign up. Uh, it's pitchdb.com slash the real Jason Duncan, pitchdb.com slash the real Jason Duncan. Easy to remember. Everybody that follows me knows my brand name. So tell everybody about the pricing and the options because it's not expensive at all. It's actually a lot cheaper than I thought it was going to be. And, you know, I might encourage you as a business coach to raise your prices, <laughs> but, but it's really inexpensive. So tell other people about how they can sign up and how much it costs and what they get. Yep. So traditionally, if you were to go to pitchdb.com, you would see that pitchdb starts at $97 a month. So there's a $97 a month plan, a 197 plan, and then a 497 plan, right? And that's depending on how many pitches a person wants to send out. But because of Jason being who Jason is, um, we decided to do a, an AppSumo style plan. If you know about AppSumo, you can get a lifetime deal, right? And the lifetime deals are usually sufficient for the average person to use it whenever they need it. But for the power user, you can upgrade to a larger amount. But the lifetime deal will give you access to contact 10 press opportunities, whether it's podcast, media, uh, speaking gigs or whatever every month for $97, right? So for $97, you can reach out to 10 podcasters and we're averaging one booking per five pitches. So you'll probably be booked on one to two podcasts for paying us $97 one time, 
you pay once every month, we give you 10 new pitches, right? And you can just keep reaching out to those 10 people should take you 10 minutes a month to pitch 10 podcasts. You just sit back and wait on the responses. Here's the great thing about it. When you first start, you're going to suck. I'm going to tell you why that's important. You're going to be really bad at it. But as you get better at getting on podcasts, the podcast host will start looking you up and they'll see, oh, he's been on 40 podcasts. Come on over. Right. I think Jason and I met because he heard me on another podcast. Right. So a lot of times that's how it works. It comes down to, um, you know, having some exposure and then people can vet vet that exposure for you. Um, so you'll get better over time. But for ninety seven dollars, you can start getting on one to two podcasts a month and learning to practice your message and get more exposure for your business. Well, I, I love it. So if you guys are interested, anybody listening to this is wanting to be on a stage, on a microphone at a podcast, or you want to get print media, go to pitchdb.com. It's P-I-T-C-H-D-B.com slash the real Jason Duncan. And you'll get the opportunity to sign up, just like Ron talked about, for lifetime access for as little as 77 bucks. But you could do the $97 plan, what he just talked about, which gets you 10 pitches per month, no monthly fees everything that you need to get on two, two to 10 podcasts per month. Um, and, and you can watch your personal brand grow. I can tell you from experience that people's brands grow through podcasting and you can either be the host or you can be the guest and they, both of these works. And if you can do both even better, Ron, well, it's such a pleasure to know you and meet you. And uh, if you ever come to Nashville on your way to see your mama in St. Louis, uh, we need to get together and hang out. Cause I think you'd be a fun dude to hang out with. So thank you for being on the show, man. It's an honor to know you. And I wish you continued success in Medellin and uh, way to go, man. You're doing great. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share with your, with your audience. Well, there you have it. Another successful entrepreneur and his journey to success. And as he defines success about making sure that you are doing something, pursuing something worthwhile and, and are comfortable with doing that for the rest of your life. So you got to ask yourself, is that what you're pursuing? And I hope that you are. And I think his story about facing his fears and moving to San Pedro Sula right out of the gate to face the most dangerous place on earth is a really a good story for us as entrepreneurs to do the same thing, to face our fears as entrepreneurs, to look down the barrel of what scares you most and know that you're going to be OK and know that you're going to turn out all right, just like he has. So I hope that you've taken some uh, solace and some encouragement from Ron's story today. Isn't that funny? Ron Story Jr. told Ron Story. So uh, I want you to go to pitchdb.com slash the real Jason Duncan and sign up for that account. It's 97 bucks lifetime access to get you in front of every podcast that you want to get in front of every social or uh, every uh, print media and get you on stages. So go to the real uh, pitchdb.com slash the real Jason Duncan. And if you want to follow Ron directly on uh, anything on social media, he's at Ron Story Jr. for Junior. Ron Story Jr. on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. And his website is ronstoryjr.com. So big thanks to Ron for coming to us on the show today. Thank you for tuning in. I will talk to you again next time when we have another entrepreneur talking about his journey to success. Until then, I am the real Jason Duncan, and Jesus is King. Attention business owners. Attention business owners. Feeling burnout from running your business? Uncertain if you're nearing burnout? Take our free 10-question business burnout test at businessburnouttest.com to discover where you stand. With just 10 quick questions, you'll learn how to immediately begin making changes to regain freedom and success. Cut your daily operations time in half. Improve your quality of life and prepare your business for your future exit without losing revenue or profit. Visit businessburnouttest.com now and take the test. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Follow Jason on social media at The Real Jason Duncan. See you again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.